All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Michigan Business Innovation Association uh, member meeting. This is one of our virtual member meetings that we hold on a quarterly basis. And um, so let's just jump right into it. So my name is Sandra Cochran. I'm current president of the MBIA organization, and I'm very pleased to bring everyone together to um, learn uh, from each other. And I get to also play host today. So one of the things we do during our virtual member meetings is we um, bring a host to each event and we allow the host to talk a little bit about their program and just share with all the other members kind of what's going on in their neck of the woods. So um, I am the assistant dean at the WMED Innovation Center down in Kalamazoo. And so I'm gonna share my screen here in a moment and just spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about the Innovation Center before we get on to Pava and our topic for the day. So let me do a screen share. And I think I have to get into presentation mode. And how's that looking? Are we there? Are we in presentation mode? Yep. Oh, good. OK. Oh, well, it's you can still see the background. So like we can still see the background of PowerPoint, but we can see the screen. Oh, it's not quite doing what I want then. Hang on one second. Let me try this. Let's try this. And now screen share. Go to this and this. Better? Better. OK, good. Okay, so as I said, I'm Sandra Cochran, Assistant Dean. I run the WMED Innovation Center down in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and we are going to talk a little bit about that today. So the Innovation Center has actually been around for quite a while. We um, began back in the early 2000s. The building that we are currently in opened in July of 2003. So actually, um, we had our 20-year um, anniversary this year. Um, but in 2016 was when we were acquired by the School of Medicine. Um, and it, it also then we added to their campus. So they have research floors in their downtown campus um, and they've got a clinic building and they have some other uh, clinical buildings. And we are part of their research effort and we provide incubator space um, for advancing discoveries and commercialization, not necessarily of WMED research, um, our research uh, that we work on in the building could come from anywhere. So we welcome clients from all over the country, um, all over the state of Michigan. They are welcome um, to find a home with us. But it does also expand some research opportunities for our WMED learners. Um, some of our students are coming over and doing internships and um, some STTR collaborations on occasion. So having... Um, you know, a relationship with the School of Medicine is really good. And so we were renamed the WMED Innovation Center back then in 2016, and I came on board in 2017. Um, actually, it was my second stint now with the Innovation Center. I started with them way back in the 2000s and was with the center until 2008. And then I joined the SBDC for a while. And so in 2017, it was my return. Very happy to be back. Joining Madeline Pinder, who is on our, our webinar today, she is my colleague, and the two of us work very closely together um, to keep the Innovation Center running well. So we are located in a business technology research park that's owned by Western Michigan University. And as I said, we opened in 2003. Um, we are one of the Michigan smart zones and very proud to be so from very early days. Uh, we're about a 70,000 square foot incubator and accelerator. We focus on life science technologies, primarily um, drug discovery um, and contract research, but we also have some medical device programs with us and other types of technology and engineering. We have a FinTech company called Money Sprinter. We've got a sensor technology company um, called SafeSense. And we also have an automotive company called Revision Autonomy. So um, while we specialize in life sciences, um, we are a smart zone where we do cater to all of the high tech companies in the region. And so when it makes sense, we do bring in other types of technologies into the building. We do offer subsidized low cost um, lab office and conference space. Um, and we're very proud of our shared equipment space. So um, we have a lot of scientific equipment, including um, mass specs which are available for our clients to use. We've, of course, then got centrifuges and autoclaves and microscopes and all those kinds of things as well, and a whole range of support services that we can bring to our clients. Um, I'm just going to run over some of our 
programs in general, I think these are going to sound very similar to a lot of other programs around the state. So for example, we have a, we have ideation station, which is basically um, co-working office space. And so we do it on a per desk rental situation. So a client leases a desk for, I believe it's $200 a month. And um, that is their desk. They get to live there, but they're within a shared space. As you can see in the photograph, there are several desks that there's actually many more desks than that. Now, the photo was taken in the early days when we only had a few desks. Now we've got nine desks in the area as well as some couches. Um, so it's a lot more lively now. Um, we also have um, Launch My Lab. This is um, a photograph of the Launch My Lab space where you can see a variety of laboratory equipment um, out on the benches. Um, and the clients that are in the center are able to use all of this equipment free of charge, except for the mass specs. Those are the only pieces of equipment where we do charge um, by the sample run uh, because they're very expensive pieces to buy and to maintain. Um, so we, we needed to put a little bit of a premium on that. But everything else, um, if you're in the building, you get to use it. The incubators, the microscopes, the autoclaves, refrigerator, freezers, the water, the ice machine, all that kind of stuff. We also have uh, our resident incubation program. That's the primary thing that we offer. So uh, we have for dedicated laboratories. They're all approximately 500 square feet laboratories and they connect with interior doors. So clients can grow or contract as they need to, adding laboratory space or releasing it. And um, there's always a lot of movement in the building as clients are growing and shifting and moving from one lab to another, graduating out and space being refilled with new clients. Um, so there's a lot of laboratory movement throughout the building. And then another thing we offer that's a little bit unique is what we call our Skunk Works pro uh, program. So these are clients that operate within the community, but for some reason they need access to a little bit of, of extra lab space. Um, usually what we see is that they are attempting to do some sort of new business endeavor, some new market segment they're trying to go after, and they want to try something. They want to have a little bit of laboratory space to work on a new project to figure out whether or not it's going to go. And then if it does, the plan would be, you know, to relocate them back to their original site, maybe build out some lab for them back in their home base, uh, but it gives them some flexibility. And we have a variety of Skunk Works clients over the years. Currently um, in-house, we have CalSec, um, which is a company in Kalamazoo, very successful multi-million you know, million dollar global corporation, um, but they're doing some um, like food safety types of research and studies. Um, so they're, they found a home with us for the past few years. It's been really nice having them and we are open to other types of skunk work projects that make sense. We have, of course, all kinds of business support. I'm not going to read the list. You know, we've got the business equipment, the photocopier, and all that kind of stuff. We have entrepreneurial services, business plan assistance, SBIR training classes, uh, our quarterly meetings. We're in the midst of those right now. Um, and the resource network, which is so vitally important, you know, in the ecosystem is to know where to refer people to. And so this is just a small sample of the other organizations that we like to partner with. And when our clients need services that, that we don't feel, you know, that we would do the best job, we're more than happy to refer them out to others who can assist them and keep the ecosystem vibrant. Again, not going to read through the list. These are examples of some of the things that we have that we offer to our clients from equipment to um, on-site, you know, shipping and receiving. We're very proud of our free parking. <laughs> and some places in Michigan, I know, have some trouble with that. We are not in downtown. We are more on the outskirts of town. So we have a nice big parking lot, lots of free parking. And it's right up next to the building. You don't have to park in a structure and walk a block or two, like some of my colleagues do at the other W Mid building that's downtown. We have nice on-site parking. Um, these are the client companies that are currently in residence. And as you can see, there's kind of a nice mix. Um, the few that I pointed out, there were a little different. Um, the FinTech where are they? Money Sprinter is in there. Safe Sense is in there. Revision Autonomy is in there. We also have located in our building the Western Michigan University Biosciences Research and Commercialization Center. So the BRCC is actually a funding entity. Um, it has money from the state of Michigan that it is investing into other startup companies, and they have their offices with us. 
They don't have a laboratory. They just have an office. And the other one is the um, Southwest Michigan Apex Accelerator. Um, the Apex is now the name of what used to be the PTAC. So if you can remember the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, that's what Apex is. So we have a PTAC office inside the Innovation Center. Um, so not every one of our clients is a life science company or even developing technology. If it makes sense, we will bring in a partner organization to uh, be on site with us. Um, a little bit of bragging. We have won two incubation awards from the International Business Innovation Association in the past. We had Innovation of the Year um, several years ago. We also had a company win Graduate of the Year several years ago. Um, these are some of our stats since 2002. You know, over 424 companies served, jobs created, average salaries. Uh, very proud of uh, 259 patents have been applied for and over 140 have been issued. So our clients are very innovative. They do lots of amazing work. Also very proud of their um, angel and VC investment fund dollar amount. That That's a huge number. You know, $267 million is a lot. And actually, I think it's more than that. I think I'm missing some of um, Vesteron's most recent investment. They're one of our larger companies and they've been going great guns lately. So very proud of them. Great company. And with that, I will wrap up with the presentation, stop sharing, and see if anybody has any questions. Hey, Jason joined us. Hi, Jason and Carmen. Yeah. Um, I have a minute. Why don't I just go ahead and see if it will share my, my video. Share screen. I have to find it. Actually, okay, I found it. Welcome to the WMN Innovation Center, the Kalamazoo Smart Zone. Let me show you around. Okay, we're ready. The Innovation Center opened in 2003, so for the past 16 years, we've been helping entrepreneurs from across Southwest Michigan grow and prosper. They've hired employees, they've achieved outside funding, they've received SBIR grants, they've filed patents. A lot of our companies have graduated, have been acquired by other companies, have gone public. So we believe we have a very good track record in helping entrepreneurs in the technology sector in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, and math, we'd really like to see a lot more activity from women. And we think that the Innovation Center could do a lot to address that, especially in Southwest Michigan. My name is Kelly Ellsworth. I'm a plant breeder for Garden Solutions. We um, are a company trying to introduce new varieties into the ornamental plant market. Starting with Garden Solutions, right away, the capital requirements for a lab are very inhibited. The autoclaves and the biosafety cabinet and the facilities. You know, all that stuff is so expensive. And if we hadn't found this center, I, I don't know that we would have been able to get our plant breeding program going the way we are with our tissue culture lab. It's really helping us advance kind of what we're doing. And so that's very exciting. As a woman, there weren't many role models. Um, there's a few and they've been very impactful for me, but there weren't a lot of role models that I could look to and, and see what they were doing. But going into graduate school, there were so many of my peers who were women. And so I do think there's this new wave of us that is coming in. And um, I don't think that'll be the case for younger girls. <laughs> I think they're going to have a lot more role models. Our companies are growing, they're strong, and we like to keep it that way. And that's the Innovation Center. So thank you for that. Any questions before we move on? Okay, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today. So let me pull up my notes to make sure I say this all right. We have Pava LaPierre with us today. Uh, she's a social entrepreneur who is driven by the belief that entrepreneurs can save the world. She is the CEO and co-founder of Ecomap Technologies, a rapidly growing tech company and Techstars graduate that creates platforms to answer the question, who is doing what with any given um, ecosystem? 
Pava has been involved with and fun, founded multiple ventures, including serving as president of TCO Labs, where she founded The Hatchery, the first incubator for student startups at Johns Hopkins University. She's received multiple awards and recognition, having been named as a Forbes 30 Under 30, received the Inno Under 25 Award, named a Top 100 Johns Hopkins Alumni in Technology, and recognized in the Baltimore Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Women. Pava, we are very glad that you are here with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to you to share with us um, some of your insights. So, Pava, to you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I was uh, during, as you were reading that messaging, Marquise asking him where he got that bio. Uh, it was very nice, but definitely a lot. So really, I'm pleased to be with you, you all here. Um, you got to hear a little bit about my background, but I'm Pava, CEO of Ecomap Technologies. We're now a 30-person company based out of Baltimore, Maryland, and we focus really on how we make information about the ecosystems around us more accessible. Um, and I was asked to come in here and speak a little bit about that topic of how how information access or why information access matters to building successful entrepreneurial ecosystems, which I'm sure is a topic that you all think a little bit about, perhaps not, um, not too, too much, but it keeps us up at night. And so I'm, I'm happy to share the insights that we've learned. Um, I did have some slides. I'm happy to just talk, but if, um, could I share my screen? Um, cool, cool, cool. Um, Cool. I was not expecting that. Click the wrong button. So um, don't worry, I'm not going to be presenting on every single one of these slides today. Um, they are quite abridged. This is usually an hour long presentation that we give at a lot of conferences. Um, but you know, today I really want to focus on this idea of why information access matters within entrepreneurial ecosystems for doing effective ecosystem building, and also specifically how ecosystem mapping relates to that. Um, you know, as you heard a little bit about, um, I'm coming from Ecomap Tech. You know, a few years ago, this was just a little idea coming out of a research project at Johns Hopkins looking at uh, how different ecosystems present information and today we're uh, 30 I think just 30 people it might be 32 um, and we work with over 65 ecosystems across the world really focused on making them more accessible through information um, and so a little bit of background, as you all heard, uh, this started when we were at when I was at Johns Hopkins, um, I was doing ecosystem building work there and I was lucky enough well a student to have founded an incubator. Um, because the Hopkins ecosystem didn't really have anything at that point and then that incubator ended up getting acquired by the university and I got the chance to launch the official university accelerator programs. Um, and so after four years of doing ecosystem building work, um, my job went from building these ecosystems to helping people navigate them. And and that's when I really first ran into the issue of, you know, we live and work in these ecosystems every day, as you just presented about a lot of what your center does is you provide these different programs and services. But when you don't know how to support an entrepreneur, you don't have a program that's targeted to them, you hand them off to somebody else in the ecosystem. Um, but every time I was trying to tell an entrepreneur about the different information or the programs and the entrepreneur support organizations that existed in Baltimore or in the Hopkins ecosystem, I realized that there was no like central source of information for all of the those different programs, all the opportunities, all the different funders. And that just seemed kind of ridiculous. So we did this big research project. We looked at over 100 ecosystems across the world, really with that question of like, how do people get information about what exists in your ecosystem? Um, and we continually heard that people really wanted to have some type of platform or tool that gave them information about their ecosystem, but it was really, really hard to get the data. Um, it just took way too long to map out the ecosystem, to tag everything, to get all the people to fill out the survey about their program to keep that data updated and that was what was really prohibiting it so we got really nerdy we leaned on uh, my background in computer science to build some basic algorithms and a platform that mapped out baltimore's innovation ecosystem and we put that online as a pure mvp there was no back end the algorithms weren't done nothing like that and um, it really exploded so over the past two and a half three years we went from one person with an idea and a platform held together with duct tape and suddenly we were courting you know giant foundations and ecosystems across the world to build these platforms going from one person to 30 over that three year period. And now we're lucky enough to work with a ton of ecosystems, not only in the United States, but also across the world, spanning, you know, statewide entrepreneurial ecosystems to ecosystems like Venture for America and their talent network 
um, to corporations, as well as on the ground ecosystem building organizations, which is what uh, I used to do and where my heart truly lies. Um, the fun part about this is that as we do create technology to map out all of these ecosystems, we have to do a lot of studying about how ecosystems work. Um, and so I get the unique pleasure of spending most of my time being an absolute nerd. Um, my COO, Sherrod, who some of you may have known, he, he does a lot of the growth in the sales. I help build the technology. And as we understand and map more and more ecosystems, we get a lot of really great information about how they work, right? How, what is the difference between a rural ecosystem versus a more dense urban ecosystem in terms of how people get support? Uh, what are the different structures that you see throughout different ecosystems? How do people use resources in concentric ecosystems? All of this nerdy stuff we get to compile into presentations and white papers and conference speeches. Um, and so this is a little bit about the basis of where we get the information that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, and so at any point, I'm always happy to just like answer questions. You won't, I won't talk a lot about what we do at Ecomap at all, not why I'm here, but always happy to entertain any questions about, um, you know, the ecosystem theory or any of the things that we've seen in the field. Because today we're specifically kind of focused on that question of how does ecosystem mapping contribute to building effective entrepreneurial ecosystems. We all kind of know conceptually that when we do ecosystem building, one of the first things that we often do is ecosystem mapping, right? If you're trying to get people together, you say, who's in the room? What are they doing? What are they providing? And who is it for? Um, but what we're really looking at is why is that information helpful? And how can we do that in a way that preserves resources for the meaningful activities? Um, we all here, um, you know, being entrepreneur support organizations or ecosystem building orgs, we know that the success of an entrepreneurial journey is often determined by whether or not an entrepreneur can get information about the resources they need and get access to those resources at the right time. Um, I look back at Ecomap's journey and we, you know, at the very early stages, we needed mentorship, which we got at the right time. And then we got some pre-seed funding. And then it was right in this period where we went and just absolutely took off. And I was so unprepared for that. And I was struggling for months trying to keep up with that growth. And I was about to honestly bankrupt the company because I just couldn't keep up with it. And behind my back, a bunch of mentors in Baltimore were thinking about how can we connect her to a COO who can really help stabilize this, which is how I met Sherrod, right? So the story of a successful entrepreneurial journey is the injection of these resources at the right time. Some of these led by the entrepreneur themselves, some of them led by their advisory network, some of them led even by the broader ecosystem. Um, and we know that you know, the easier access to information we have about the ecosystems around them, the more rapid and effective cycles of entrepreneurial support we can perform, right? Um, this is such a simplistic way of how entrepreneur support and ecosystem building goes. But in an ideal, in an ideal world, you know, one of your portfolio companies says, I need this, uh, this specific mentor. And you say, OK, well, here is somebody you can talk to for that. Or I need this funding program. And you can connect them to that resource. And then they're able to grow. And as they go throughout that cycle, they're going to need more and more different types of resources resources. And one of the hallmarks of an effective ecosystem is actually the shortening of this process, right? How long does it take from a company to have a need to get to the right resource and then to move on to the next stage of their business growth and then repeat the cycle? Um, and so one of the big mistakes, though, that we often make with um, ecosystem mapping and information access is that we assume the problem is whether or not an entrepreneur can actually access information about resources. Um, and I know I'm standing up here as a company who is talking to you about how you make information more accessible. Um, but the problem isn't just in accessing the information. It's often about whether or not the entrepreneur understands um, what those resources are, how they can best leverage them, and most importantly, whether or not they actually have access to them at the right time. Um, and this is kind of the basis of this idea of the layers of information access, right? Um, this is like a very part of our abstract part of our theory, but it's essentially saying it's like information about resources within an ecosystem per se, that information exists, that's the base state. Um, and then you can make people aware of that information. An entrepreneur probably knows that there is funding out there for their you know, business within the Michigan innovation ecosystem. But that's different than them having access to that information, right? And that's largely what our company focuses on is getting all of that data into one place so people can access it. But that's not enough, right? People still have to be able to understand what you do with that information. And that is different yet 
still from actually using that information, actually engaging with that funder, getting that funding and using it to grow their business, right? Um, and so while building effective ecosystems is a lot about increasing access to information, it also has to be done in a way that preserves resources like time, money, and attention for other types of ecosystem building work. Because ecosystem mapping helps you with the identification and the awareness of information, right? For sure. Um, but it does not help people understand and utilize that information as much as it needs to be. And that's really where the ESOs and the on the ground um, entrepreneur support organizations come in, right? Um, and oftentimes what we've seen from God, the dozens of ecosystems we've worked with at this point is that they get a lot of you know resources in order to do ecosystem building. And then they put $500,000 towards trying to do ecosystem mapping and building a platform. And that leaves no resources available for the actual on the ground relationship building work that actually moves the needles for a lot of these companies. Um, and so what we really look at and what I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about today is how you know we can use ecosystem mapping and make that process a little bit easier um, so that it, you can preserve more resources for the on the ground important meaningful work. Um, I'm going to disclaim this by saying that was like this is largely what we do for a living and how we have solved this problem is that we built a lot of very fancy AI based algorithms that allow us to go out and get all of this information and scrape it and monitor it and categorize it and keep it up to date over time and monitor the ecosystem for changes. And if you don't have that, that is awesome. That's what I'm focused on today, right? Like how you can make this process easier even without using technology or how you can kind of lay the foundation for it because it is a very complex problem. And if not kind of approached carefully, you can end up spending 12 months and you know a quarter of a million dollars trying to do this and not have the time and resources to do the relationship building and the one-on-one -on -one support. So we all know that ecosystem mapping has benefits, right? Um, it helps you understand what exists in your ecosystem, who is doing what, what ESOs are providing which programs. This allows you to hopefully foster collaboration and reduce the silos. Although we have learned after years of doing this that people can have perfect access to information and there will still be silos. Um, it was one of the most intriguing phenomena that we witnessed. Um, but it also helps you better inform program development, right? If you know what all your partners in your resource network are doing, you can make a more informed decision about, well, we just got a new grant to launch a new program. What should that program be? What audience should it target? Where is the gap in the ecosystem? Um, it helps you engage stakeholders by providing a way for both entrepreneurs and investors and advisors and mentors and ESOs to get real-time information about what is happening within that ecosystem ecosystem and where they can contribute. And it also lets you promote your ecosystem to external stakeholders. I'm sure many of you, if not one of you or all of you have had to have your hands in all of these federal grants uh, that are happening recently. And a big part of those grant programs is often allocation for creating some way to showcase what the ecosystem has, right? Who those partners are, um, what everyone is working on. Um, because a lot of ecosystems are frankly like competing to become the next entrepreneurial hubs. And what's awesome about it is that it's not a zero sum game, right? Um, just Baltimore becoming a tech hub does not limit, you know, Philadelphia becoming a tech hub and all of that. So it helps with promoting what your ecosystem has. And it also makes the ecosystem not only more navigable, but also more accessible, right? If you don't have a good repository of information about your ecosystem, then people can only get that information from conversations, from interpersonal relationships, which is super not only not super effective, but it's also super exclusionary, right? Especially from underserved entrepreneurs who are not already in the network. So that's great, but ecosystem mapping is really hard. Um, and a lot of the reasons why it's so hard is that you're dealing with a lot of really, really unwieldy data, right? Um, and so when you go out to like map the ecosystem, um, one of the first things you have to do is figure out like, okay, what are the different categories? How are we gonna tag things? And then what likely ensues is a two hour conversation about what should be considered an incubator and what is an accelerator. Um, and so you have to figure out how you're gonna make this data paradigm. What are you gonna tag things? What information do you need to collect. If you make a survey too long, people aren't going to fill it out. If you make it too short, you're not going to get the data that you need. Um, no matter how you shake it, it's time consuming to get that data, whether or not you map it out with um, like manually by identifying everything, whether you try to get each of the partners to give information about their programs. It takes a lot of time and then it takes even more time to go review that data to make sure it's accurate and it matches 
the kind of data structure that you'd laid out. Um, if you decide to go the survey route, you got to send Tim 92 emails to make sure that he fills out your survey. Um, and even then he may not fill it out appropriately and you got to go back and edit that data. Um, and the really kind of irony of it and really the first problem that I realized when building Ecomap is that after you do all of that work, the data set goes out of date. The moment somebody launches a new program or changes their website or they change what that program focuses on or they end one, then your data set is out of date and you have to find a way to maintain it. Um, and then after all of that, you still have to put it on some type of website so people can interact with it. Um, and so ecosystem mapping, while it seems like an easy exercise to just identify everyone in your ecosystem and what they're doing, it usually ends up being the super complex task um, that takes a lot of time and resources away from ecosystem building work. And so what I try to do here is kind of break down the fundamental steps of ecosystem mapping. And I use a lot of the basis that we design for how our technology works, but applying it in a manual way, right? Um, in order to build algorithms that do this, we had to really, really, really study the best way to do it manually. Um, and that's really what I'm focused on here. Um, and so the steps that I'm taking you through are both what we, you know, do with technology, but also what you can do if you don't really have access to technology, um, or at least like advanced AI algorithms at the minimum. Um, and so the first part, which is a little bit uh, counterintuitive is this idea of creating a data paradigm, right? Um, I spend vast majority of my waking hours thinking about our data paradigm and how we collect information. And it's a lot of jargony words. A data paradigm is just a fancy way of saying what is the type of information that you're trying to collect and the categories about how you're going to categorize it, right? Um, it's so this gives you a structure for collecting this information so you can make sure that it is actually something you can analyze or somebody can navigate in a consistent way. And so there's usually kind of three parts to a good data paradigm, which I try to break out here. The first is good descriptive data, right? Descriptive information tells you about like what something is, right? They literally sentences that describe programs. So it might be a short description and a longer description about what a resource is, right? It is simply describing that asset. Um, it also includes things such as like a logo and the name and the website and the contact information, um, things that are used to identify any asset within your ecosystem. Then you have the categorical information. These are the tags or the keywords as we call them. This is where you have that fight about what's an incubator, what's an accelerator, what is early stage versus what is idea stage. These categories are really important because if you do ecosystem mapping without defining categories, um, often you get data that you can't um, analyze because it's not consistent or you hand it over to an entrepreneur and you have every venture capital firm in the entire state listed as early stage because that is what all of their websites say. Um, and so you get, um, get defining good categories and making sure that people stick to them when gathering the data is super important. Finally, you have the relational information. And this shows you how different assets relate to other assets within the ecosystem. Um, I realize now that I skipped over my intro to ecosystem slide, um, which I'm gonna, you know, call out just so I can point out what I'm saying when I say assets, right? Um, assets are just the things that make up the nodes of a network of an ecosystem, right? These things can be people, organizations, resources slash programs, right? Um, all of you are an asset, all of your organizations are assets, the programs that you throw are assets, but we also have things such as activity and opportunities. So jobs, events, news, um, those are all different assets and they're related to each other by relationships, these edges, right? Um, this this is a lot, a lot deeper in our theoretical work, but I realize now that I've been throwing around that term without really breaking it down. So the relational data talks about how different assets relate to each other. What organizations are partnering together on this grant program? Who is involved in this initiative? Um, what mentor is leading this technical assistance program? Whatever it might be. The relational information helps you actually understand who is related, where the silos are, and where there could be more collaboration. The keywords are the categories that allow you to kind of get that categorical data. Um, and so I wish I could sit here and just hand you over like a list of all of the correct keywords. Um, I'm sorry to report that we have a team of like three to four people, including a linguist who has been doing that for the last four years. It is not an easy thing to do. We're always happy to give recommendations. Like we can share sample paradigms as we call them, but the types of categories that you need are gonna really depend on what type of ecosystem you're in. Obviously a lot of your presentation was about like, like deep tech and science and that, you know, heavy R&D based um, 
why am I literally forgetting the word, more R&D based ecosystems. And for that, you do need categories such as like who has wet lab space, right? Who has bench space, all of those different things. And so your paradigm for keywords has to change based off of the ecosystem that you're looking at. Um, And so I'm always happy to just talk one-on-one with anybody who's like going through this and needs to define it because like, I thought this would be the easy part and this, you know, four years, millions of dollars later was not the easy part. Um, And so defining the tags is going to be super important up front, because if you don't define them up front, you run into a lot of issues where you're collecting the information. So a data paradigm needs to be defined in terms of like what fields you're going to create, what categories you have, what the values in them are, and what type of relationships you're going to get before you start to gather the data. Because then you got to collect the information. Um, And it seems simple, right? You've defined your data paradigm. Now you just collect the data. But there's a lot of things that can go wrong in this process. Um, And so I'm actually first going to look at the mistakes, right? Um, Because this is often where ecosystem builders, we see them go through the whole process. And then like at the end, they're like, this actually isn't what we needed. Um, So the first mistake is not defining that paradigm. Um, And the reason that you have to do this is that let's say halfway through your process of mapping your ecosystem, you suddenly decide that you want to have five stages of companies instead of four. Now, every single thing that you've collected in the data set and tagged with a stage needs to be reconsidered, right? Um, If you decide to add incubator in addition to accelerator into your paradigm, now every single program has to be re-looked at to see whether or not it meets that definition. So if you don't define the paradigm up front, it's not the end of the world, but it's gonna make for a lot more stop and go and having to go back and review the data. Um, The other mistake that we see is relying too excessively on just survey data. And the reason for this is that it's very unlikely that people are actually going to follow the same rules that you define for how you define these different categories. Um, We have seen ecosystems literally make a dictionary that says this is all of the traits of an early stage funding source and only use this if it meets these criteria. And still, you get like growth stage private equity being like, yeah, we're early. Um, And so when you rely on survey data, it's just the fact of the matter is that people aren't aware of necessarily what the paradigm is, or they may interpret the categories differently. They may not read your dictionary, or they may just not fill out the survey fully. Um, And so you really want to try to get at the minimum, like a team of interns is honestly better than trying to get it just pure survey data. Oftentimes, the right middle ground is to use a survey to have people identify all the programs that they offer and like a link to the source and have somebody else go tag them to make sure that it is consistent. Finally, um, there has to be some type of way to update the data set. And so this isn't necessarily just saying like you need to be able to go edit your spreadsheet, but you have to have a system to say, okay, if you aren't monitoring the website for changes continually, what cadence are you going to go update it, right? Are you going to email everyone once a year saying, please review this? Are you going to go look at their websites once a year? Um, How are you going to make sure that dates and deadlines stay up to date? Without that, you lose trust in the data set. Um, So you might send this information to an entrepreneur and if they go and click on the first link and the website is down or it doesn't exist, they're likely not going to really trust the rest of that data set, even if the rest of the data set is perfect, right? So figuring out a way to update the data set at the start or at least to disclosing to people when the last time it was updated is super important. So once you have, you know, those mistakes in mind, when it comes to collecting the data, there's kind of three, three main things to know. The first is you need to kind of define the boundaries of the ecosystem. One of my favorite parts of ecosystem theory is that uh, the definition of an ecosystem changes based off of how you describe it, uh, which is a super fun concept. Um, But you could be looking just at like Michigan's um, high tech ecosystem, or you could do the entrepreneurial ecosystem and then include small businesses. But maybe you only want to include service businesses and not small retail businesses. So you have to define your ecosystem up front to understand who is going to be a valid asset within that data set. Um, And you can also do this by just saying, which categories do you care about the most? When we work with customers, you know, oftentimes we set up our pricing so that it could be used by any ecosystem. So even if there was like an entire statewide ecosystem, but they only had like $5,000, we wanted to make sure that we could work with them. And how we do that is by like ranking all of these assets in order of, of importance. Like, okay, we're going to go out and get every single accelerator program for you, then every single technical assistance program, then every funding program. Um, So identifying those assets that matter the most to their ecosystem, whether those are types of resources or different organizations, is one way to define the boundaries of what is in the ecosystem and what is not. The second is like, please use a a database or a database-like tool. 
Um, probably the worst thing you can do here is like putting this in like a, a Google document or like a Notion document or anything that's not structured data. Um, I mean, we, we've we dealt with everything from people like sending us images with their ecosystem app on it and being like, can you extract this? And like, boy, that took a while to build an algorithm that could. Um, but like, you really wanna keep it in a database, like a Google sheet or an Airtable, uh, because otherwise it's gonna be just nearly impossible to get that into any type of interface to interact with it, keep it up to date over time. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, you want to train a team. Um, crowdsourcing ecosystem data does lead to inaccuracies. So really, like a group of like college freshmen will do this more consistently than like a trained person sending out a survey to 35 people in the ecosystem to get them to just fill it out. Um, and that's purely because of the standardization and the familiarity with the task. Um, and so students uh, coming, yeah, I see two. I know one university. I see another university logo here like use the students, they do a really good job of this. Um, okay, so finally, once you have all of that data collected, right, and um, I'm happy to talk about I'm trying to fit this all into a 20 minute presentation, I'm almost up happy to talk about the process for how you do this research. Um, but once you have that data set, which honestly looks a little bit like this, right, you have all your resources, and then the tags, and then the links and everything, you need to find a way to share it. And one of the really like big travesties that we've noticed is that sometimes we'll see people collect a really good ecosystem data set and then they'll share it with their network somewhere like this, right? Like they put it in a network graph and they're like, here is our ecosystem, find information. And like, this is super, from a nerd's perspective, this is awesome. I, that, that, that is fantastic. Absolutely no entrepreneur wants to find a funding source looking in that, that type of way. So what you do want to try to get is some type of platform with filters, right? With ways that people can filter down and categorize it and search through these things in a database-like format. It does not have to be one of ours. There are options out there, but it needs to be in some type of structured way where they can use all of those categories that you define and filter it down. Um, because without that ability to filter and narrow and see the data um, in a way that is meant for comprehension, not for analysis, all of that work kind of falls flat. And so while it's super cool to stick it in a diagram like this, where sometimes you see, I think Cincinnati has one of those like charts where it's like a railway and they have everyone conceptually placed on a different part of the sun, half of the sunshine diagram. Marquise, if you have an image of that, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's an awesome graphic. Absolutely no entrepreneur wants to use it. So the best, most boring way to do this is just a directory if you want the data to be consumed. And after that, go give it to the graphic design interns and tell them to have a blast making it look cool. But there should be a way for people to access that that is just a very boring directory, even the spreadsheet itself, if you set up the permissions so they can't edit it, because that is how we as humans are trained to kind of consume this type of information. After that, ideally you wanna put it into an ecosystem platform and it should have features that allow people to filter it, to contextualize the data, like add text to it to say, here's a guide and then reference the data. Here's a collection that I made just for you, or here's all the best resources for like women or high growth companies, whatever it might be. Ideally things that can lay out pathways throughout the ecosystem and a way for people to claim and add their data is also important. Huh, I like, I limited my own slides so I wouldn't go over time, so. Um, that is a quick presentation about, um, you know, the uh, ways to information access within ecosystems and the ways to kind of map out the ecosystem. I know that was a lot very quickly without breaks. And so I'm going to pause there for any questions. And I'm also happy to dive into like any of the topics that you want me to talk more about. That was awesome. Thank you. Wow. So much to think about. Um questions anyone yes jason go ahead i just have a question about the differences between uh ecosystems from rural to a more urban groups because you know i i work in a more uh, rural location and so I, mm -hmm. I understand that connecting is a little bit different versus um maybe in more of an urban um uh situation do you have any thoughts and it looks like you have the perfect slide to discuss this right now 
Yes, uh, well, this was actually a talk we gave at, um, I think, IMBAA this year um, about like the differences between the two. And so I'd say there's kind of like five high level differences. And one of the things that bothers me is that this is really like looking at sparse versus dense networks in some ways, um, but rural versus urban is often how we describe these. So when you look at rural ecosystems, you know, the five ways that they differ is that they tend to be smaller and more interconnected. Um, so you have fewer nodes within the ecosystem, like fewer assets, but a lot thicker edges between them. Um, and so, you know, even though there may be relatively fewer resources, organizations, whatever, they're more tightly interrelated, um, which is awesome. But that also means um, that they have a few specific traits. So it's like you see a lot fewer ecosystem silos within rural ecosystems because it's harder for people not to know what's going on. And you tend to get greater collaboration with better information flows because tighter relationships means more trust and people, it's easier to share information. But it does run a really high risk of becoming embedded, which is a really nerdy way to say it can be harder to change an ecosystem where everyone is so interconnected because everything is so interconnected. So we do see that rural ecosystems, there can sometimes be a little bit harder to change. Like you may pop up and say like, oh, I wanna start a new program. And that might be harder to do that in a rural community versus like in Baltimore where the ecosystem is bigger and there's more room to move about. The second thing is that information flows mostly through people. So instead of getting information asynchronously, um, people hear about it from other people, right? Like I was talking to Michelle and she shared information about this resource, which is great because Oh, there's the little pyramid again. It's great because um, people trust information more that comes from people, but it's bad for access and expanding the size of the ecosystem because people are a limited resource. Sorry, I thought there was a bird in here for a second. It wouldn't be impossible. And I was like, oh, bird. Um, second, um, there's typically fewer assets, meaning the, each of the influence of each of them is greater or third. So people, organizations, resources, opportunities, et cetera, those are the assets. Um, in rural ecosystems, there are fewer of those, but each individual asset has a lot greater influence, right? Um, and so people tend to be the most influential asset within rural ecosystems and or um, compared to urban ecosystems where it's actually the organizational unit that tends to be more persistent and influential. Um, with rural ecosystem, the assets are usually broader. They focus on a lot, like you might have one organization that serves all types of businesses, whereas in an urban ecosystem, you have one that focuses on small businesses, one that focuses on high growth tech businesses, one that focuses on R&D. Um, and that's the same with resources. Finally, uh, one of the big differences is the awareness of the different entrepreneurs and local businesses. It is pretty common that you have a great idea of all the local businesses in your area, whereas in an urban ecosystem, we have no idea. You could not list every startup, every local business. And so that really changes how you approach entrepreneur support and attraction. Almost finally, concept of ecosystems matter more. So in rural ecosystems, because there's fewer assets, you have to look out to the concentric regions more and more. So the town, region, state, and federal resources, which means that the resource stack of a given business looks a little bit different than it would in an urban ecosystem where we tend to tap into a few locally and then go more national. And then finally, um, there is differences in how you map the ecosystem and the adoption of new tech, which is a pretty long section. So I'll skip over that. So hopefully that's a high level answer to that question. That's great. Thank you. Um, we've got like about eight minutes. So is there, is there another question? I think we have time for one more before we let Carmen bring up the end. I can't see everybody. So I don't, if anybody wants to ask a question, unmute and just ask it because I can't see everybody. There I am. Now I see everybody. Um, I I kind of have one. So um, how how this is maybe a little bit more specific for EcoMap. How do you determine the boundaries of an ecosystem? Like yeah, you know, I mean, it's easy if you just look at a state or if you look at a city. But but ecosystem is you know they bleed right. They go over those mm -hmm. boundaries. How, how does that work? How should it work? Yeah. The best way, um, at least in our end, that how we have found to do it is that you kind of define the ecosystem based off of both who the target audience is and what you're trying to get out of the information. And then you can kind of back that into the specific definition. Like there's one way to define an ecosystem, right? Where it's like, 
this is the formal definition and the ecosystem has these unifying characteristics and these unifying factors can be like geography. So you have Baltimore's tech ecosystem and Maryland's business ecosystem, the industry. So there is this way to kind of define the ecosystem and that gives you a little bit of information, right? Um, if I'm looking at the Johns Hopkins University entrepreneurial ecosystem or the Johns Hopkins University medical device ecosystem, right? But how we tend to do it is we take that broad ecosystem and we back it into who is the likely target audience? Who is the customer want to focus on and what are they trying to learn? And we use that to identify all of the categories of assets that matter the most to them to collect information about. So if I'm looking at, you know, a, um, a tech ecosystem, I might actually collect information about the different tech startups within the area because those are pretty influential. It's not as many. But if we're looking at a small business ecosystem, it can be sometimes a fool's errand to try to collect that data. So instead, we focus on the support infrastructure more. So we do it in two ways. First, starting with like the formal definition that the customer and then backing that into the asset classes that are going to matter to them the most with the knowledge that they can go add on assets or expand that definition as they go on if they'd like to. And does that happen pretty frequently? They start out where they think they know it's something and then it it, it changes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's not even changes. They just add to it. So usually yeah. like if we have a really small ecosystem, we usually collect like the entrepreneur support organizations and their funding and technical assistance programs. And then they usually add layers of that or they add like a different geography. Mm. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to stay cognizant of our time. We only have about five minutes left. So Carmen, I'm going to welcome you and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And I just really want to thank Pava and Marquise and, um, you know, for your presentation. It's really helpful to provide value to our members. Um, hi to my fellow MBIA um, board and ecosystem members. I'm glad to see you here today. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the value that we do bring to our MBIA members and just remind everybody that we provide a variety of activities to members throughout the ecosystem in all different levels and geographies. Here recently, we've been doing a lot of virtual meetings, so we do have regular member meetings such as these where we bring in somebody um, and spotlight one of our members so that they can showcase their activities as, uh, as Sandra did earlier in the meeting. Um, and then we also um, join that together with somebody uh, who could provide a resource to our members as well. So we, we provide these members member meetings quarterly. Um, and then when we can, we do them in person. Um, we also have annual membership meetings where we bring everybody together, continue to bring resources and value to our members and get together and hopefully see each other in person on at least an annual basis, if not more than that. Um, in addition to that, we have a repository of resources on our member website, uh, our member only login section of our website. Where we have a lot of samples and template documents and a lot of resources specifically geared toward our Michigan uh, members here. We have an online event calendar that's open to all. That's on our website where individuals can see other ecosystem events uh, that we're either hosting or or just spreading the word about. Um, and stay tuned, we're gonna be launching a new website here soon. So while that information is there, um, it'll have a new skin and it'll be easier to navigate. Um, that's also a value to our member that we heard, our members that we heard last year, um, that we, we needed an up-to-date website. So we've been putting resources toward that over this last year. Um, we have a regular newsletter that goes out to again, continue to spread the word of your activities throughout the Michigan ecosystem. So if you're a member, um, you'll be able to get your information content in our newsletter that goes out to the ecosystem. Um, there is connectivity through social media um, in the activities that we're doing, but also additional resources that go out via social media. Um, and then if you are a member, you get preferred rates through different uh, providers that we have relationships with um, at any given time. Um, in the past, those have been through insurance um, companies. They've been through um, uh, uh, mobile um, and communications and telecommunications companies. That's a current one. Um, so we'd like to, you to be able to um, gain access to those if you're interested in becoming a member. Um, we also are a source of incubation best practices, not only on the state level, but also the national level. We have deep connections to NBIA and are able to share information uh, wherever and however we can. Um, and then we also help provide um, uh, capacity building to uh, regional and um, uh, statewide um, 
ecosystem events. So some of you might have heard of Glynn too in the past. Uh, we provide a lot of resources to that event that happens on uh, here in the upper Midwest. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about some of the value you can get from being a member. Uh, we have different membership levels. Um, I would direct anybody listening to this webinar today to go to our website, take a look at the different membership levels. Um, and the, in addition to that, I will add that we provide advocacy to the Michigan legislature as well. Typically, we've had a legislature day um, pre-pandemic, and uh, we might be bringing that back in the past. Um, so we just want to be able to share some of those activities and note those with you today. Um, I won't go into a great deal about the membership rates, but I will just make note that there are memberships for individuals as well as um, uh, uh, organizations here in Michigan, and they also have a variety of levels depending on how many seats that you're looking to um, get from NBIA. Um, and then lastly, we also have a member directory that's searchable and could be promoted. Um, and then we also also have other opportunities to promote your events um, as they come, uh, as they're scheduled. So if you have any questions at all, I encourage you to reach out to myself um, through the MBIA website or through social media. I encourage you to reach out to one of the other board members, Sandra, Cheryl, and the rest. Um, if you have any questions, we look forward to hearing from you. And I appreciate everybody being here today. And with that, we're just about at three o'clock. Um, I just like to, on behalf of NBIA, please thank you again, Parva, for giving your presentation. We appreciate you, Marquise. And thank you to everybody for joining us here today. It's good to see you, Jason and Cheryl and Mandel Madeline. Um, and of course, Sandra. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Thanks Bye. for having us. Thank you.